Hello, hello, welcome back to the second section of There, There by Tommy Orange. We started this one last time, so if you're looking to start from the beginning, just go back one video and you'll be all caught up. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, hi, I'm Julie, I read books over here. Um, and oh, I also wanna say happy Thanksgiving. Uh, today is Thanksgiving in the United States when I'm recording this. Um, it's not celebrated in France where I currently am, but I am going to be making a full Thanksgiving dinner. So um, wish me luck with that. But anyway, um, I think it's also important to say like, um, we need to remember that the history of Thanksgiving is not so clear cut as we were once led to believe, like growing up in school, you know, it's not just a happy meal with the American Indians and the pilgrims, like there's kind of a dark history behind it, um, as was talked about in the prologue of this book, which you should go back and read again if you um, have forgotten. So yeah, just to, you know, remember that it might be a, a difficult holiday for some people. Um, but if you are celebrating, I hope that you're feeling thankful and spending time with your families. Um, that being said, we're going to be starting on page 33. We're in the middle of Dean Oxidine's chapter. Um, and it's at the first page break near the top. So let's jump in. Dean only realizes he's been stuck underground between stations for 10 minutes after 10 minutes of being stuck underground between stations. He breaks a sweat at the top of his forehead, thinking about being late or missing the panel. He didn't submit a sample work, so he would have to waste the little time he does have to explain why. How it was originally his uncle's idea, how it's really his project, and how a lot of what he's proposing is based on what his uncle told him in the short time they had together. And then the weirdest part, the part he can't present because he doesn't totally understand it, is that each of the interviews, the interviews his uncle actually conducted, came with scripts. Not transcriptions, but scripts. So had his uncle written the scripts to be performed? Or had he transcribed actual interviews and then turned them into script form? Or had he interviewed someone and then based the interview, made a script that he would rework, and then had someone else perform the reworked script? There's no way to know. The train starts up, moves for a beat, then stops again. A staticky voice from above drones incomprehensibly. Back at school, Dean wrote Lens everywhere he could. Each place he tagged would be like a place he could look out from. Imagine people looking at his tag. He could see them seeing above their lockers, on the back of the bathroom stall doors, on the tops of desks, in the bathroom stall, tagging the back of the door, Dean thought about how sad it was to want everyone to see a name that wasn't his. A name written to no one, to everyone, and to imagine them looking at it like it was a camera lens. It was no wonder he hadn't made a single friend in middle school yet. When he got home, his uncle wasn't there. His mom was in the kitchen. Where's Lucas? Dean said. They're keeping him overnight. Keeping him over, keeping him where overnight? The hospital. For what? Your uncle's dying. What? I'm sorry, honey. I wanted to tell you. I didn't think it would happen like this. I thought it could be a nice visit, and then he'd go and... Dying of what? He's been drinking too much for too long. His body, his liver's going. Going? But he just got here, Dean said. And he saw that this made his mom cry, but only for a second. She wiped her eyes with the back of her arm and said, There's nothing we can do at this point, honey. But why wasn't something done when it could have been done? There are some things we can't control. Some people we can't help. He's your brother. What was I supposed to do, Dean? There was nothing I could have done. He's been doing this most of his life. Why? I don't know. What? I don't know. I don't fucking know. Please, Norma said. She lost hold of the plate she'd been drawing. They both stared at the pieces of it on the floor between them. At the 12th Street station, Dean runs up the stairs, but then looks at his phone and sees that he's not actually going to be late. When he gets to street level, he slows to a walk. He looks up and sees the Tribune Tower. It's a faded pink glow that seems like it should be red, but lost its steam somewhere along the way. 
Aside from the plain, average height, checkered twin buildings that are the Ronald V. Dellums Federal Building complex just before I-980 on the way into West Oakland, the Oakland skyline lacks distinction and is unevenly scattered so that even when the newspaper moved down to 19th, and even though the paper doesn't exist anymore, they keep the Tribune light aglow. Dean crosses the street toward City Hall. He passes through a cloud of weed smoke from a gathering of men behind the bus stop on 14th and Broadway. He's never liked the smell except for when he's smoking it himself. He shouldn't have smoked last night. He's sharper when he doesn't. It's just that he has it around, he's gonna smoke it. And he keeps on buying it from the guy across the hall, so there it is. When Dean came home from school the next day, he found his uncle there on the couch again. Dean sat down and leaned forward with his elbows on his knees and stared at the ground, waiting for his uncle to say something. You must think I'm pretty despicable, what with me turning into a zombie out here on the couch, killing myself with a drink. Is that what she told you? Like Lucas said. She hasn't told me hardly anything. I mean, I know why you're sick. I'm not sick. I'm dying. Yeah, but you're sick. I'm sick from dying. How much time? We don't have time, nephew. Time has us. It holds us in its mouth like an owl holds a field mouse. We shiver, we struggle for release, and then it picks out our eyes and intestines for sustenance and we die the death of field mice. Dean swallowed some spit and felt his heart beat fast like he was in an argument, though it didn't have the tone or feel of an argument. Jesus, uncle, Dean said. It was the first time he'd ever called his uncle, uncle. He hadn't thought about doing it, it just came out. Lucas didn't react. How long you known? How long you known? Dean said. Lucas turned on the lamp between the two of them, and Dean felt a sick, sad feeling in his stomach when he saw that where his uncle's eyes should have been white, they were yellow. Then he felt another pang when he saw his uncle get his flask out and take a pull from it. I'm sorry you gotta see it, nephew. It's the only thing that's gonna make me feel better. I've been drinking for a long time. It helps. Some people take pills to feel okay. Pills will kill you too over time. Some medicine is poison. I guess, Dean said, and got that feeling in his stomach like when his uncle used to throw him up in the air. I'll still be around for a while, don't worry. This stuff takes years to kill you. Listen, I'm gonna get some sleep now, but tomorrow when you get home from school, let's you and me talk about making a movie together. I got a camera with a grip like a gun. Lucas makes a gun with his hand and points it at Dean. We'll come up with a single, simple concept, something we can knock out in a few days. Sure, but will you be feeling okay enough by tomorrow? Mom said, I'll be okay, Lucas said, and put his hand out flat and swept it across his chest. When Dean gets in the building, he checks the schedule on his phone and sees he has 10 minutes. He takes off his undershirt without taking off his top layer in order to use it as a kind of rag to wipe what sweat he can before he goes in front of the panel. There's a guy standing outside the door to the room he was told to go to. Dean hates who he thinks the guy is, who he has to be. He's the kind of bald that requires a daily shave. He wants it to look like he's in control of his hair, like being bald is his personal choice. But the faintest hint of hair appears on the sides and not a trace at the crown. He's got a sizable but neat light brown beard, which is clearly compensation for the lack of hair up there. Plus, a trend now. White hipsters everywhere trying to come off as confident, all the while hiding their entire faces behind big bushy beards and thick black-rimmed glasses. Dean wonders whether you have to be a person of color to get the grant. The guy's probably working with kids on a garbage art project. Dean pulls out his phone in an attempt to avoid conversation. You going for the grant? The guy says to Dean. Dean nods and sticks his hand out for a shake. Dean, he says. Rob, the guy says. Where are you from? Dean says. Actually, I don't have a place right now, but next month, me and some friends are getting a place in West Stokeland. It's dirt cheap over there, Rob says. Dean clenches his jaw and blinks a slow blink at this. Dirt cheap. 
do you grow up around did you grow up here dean says i mean no one's really from here right rob says what you know what i mean i do know what you mean dean says you know what gertrude stein said about oakland rob says dean shakes his head no but actually knows actually googled quotes about oakland when researching for his project he knows exactly what the guy is going to say. There is no there there, he says in a kind of whisper. With his goofy opened mouth smile, Dean wants to punch. Dean wants to tell him he'd looked up the quote in its original context in her everybody's autobiography and found that she was talking about how the place where she'd grown up in Oakland had changed so much that so much development had happened there that the there of her childhood, the there there was gone. There was no there there anymore. Dean wants to tell him it's what happened to native people. He wants to explain that they're not the same, that Dean is native born and raised in Oakland, from Oakland. Rob probably didn't look any further into the quote because he'd gotten what he wanted from it. He probably used the quote at dinner parties and made other people like him feel good about taking over neighborhoods they wouldn't have the guts to drive through 10 years ago. The quote is important to Dean, this there there. He hadn't read Gertrude Stein beyond the quote, but for native people in this country, all over the Americas, it's been developed over buried ancestral land, glass and concrete and wire and steel unreturnable covered memory. There is no there there. The guy says it's his time and goes in. Dean wipes his head with his undershirt one more time and puts it in his backpack. The panel of judges turns out to be a square of four tables. As he sits down, he realizes they're in the middle of talking about his project. Dean has no idea what he said he was going to do. His mind is a mess of misfires. They mention the lack of sam sample work. None of them looks at him. Are they forbidden to look at him? The makeup of the group is all over the place. Old white lady, two middle-aged black guys, two middle-aged white ladies, a youngish Hispanic guy, an Indian from India, woman who could be 25 or 35 or 45, and an older guy who's definitely native, with long hair and turquoise and silver feather earrings in both ears. They turn their heads toward Dean. He has three minutes to say whatever he thinks they should know that wasn't included in the application. A final moment to convince them that the, his project is worth funding. Hello, my name is Dean Oxidine. I'm an enrolled member of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. Good morning, and thank you for your time and consideration. Sorry ahead of time if I ramble, I'm grateful for this opportunity. I know our time is limited, so I'll just move into it if that's okay. This all started for me when I was 13. My uncle died and sort of, I inherited the work he started, what he did. What I want to do is to document Indian stories in Oakland. I want to put a camera in front of them, video, audio. I'll transcribe it when they talk if they want let them write every kind of story I can collect, let them tell their stories with no one else there, with no direction or manipulation or agenda. I want them to be able to say what they want. Let the content direct the vision. There are so many stories here. I know this means a lot of editing, a lot of watching, and a lot of listening, but that's just what our community needs considering how long it's been ignored, has remained invisible. I'm going to set up a room down at the Indian Center. What I want to do is to pay the storytellers for their stories. Stories are valuable, but to pay is to appreciate. And this is not just qualitative data collection. I want to bring something new to the vision of the Native experience as it's seen on the screen. We haven't seen the urban Indian story. What we've seen is full of the kinds of stereotypes that are the reason no one is interested in the Native story in general. It's too sad, so sad it can't even be entertaining. But more importantly, because of the way it's been portrayed, it looks pathetic. And we perpetuate that. But no, fuck that excuse, my language. But, excuse my language. Uh, it makes me mad because the whole picture is not pathetic. 
and the individual people and stories that you come across are not pathetic or weak or in need of pity and there is real passion there and rage and that's part of what I'm bringing to the project because I feel that way too. I will bring that same energy to it. I mean, if it gets approved and everything and I can raise more money, it won't take that much really, maybe even just this grant. And I'll be doing most of the work. Sorry if I went over my time. Thank you. Dean takes a deep breath and holds it. The judges don't look up at all. He lets out his breath, regrets everything he said. They stare at their laptops and type like stenographers. This is the time allotted for questions. No questions for Dean. This is when they ask each other questions, discuss the viability of the project. Fuck, he doesn't even know what he just said. The native guy taps the stack of papers that is Dean's application and clears his throat. It's an interesting idea but I'm having trouble seeing exactly what the applicant has in mind and I'm wondering, and please correct me if I missed something, I'm wondering if there's a real vision here or if he's just gonna sort of make it up as he goes along. I mean, he doesn't even have a work sample, the native guy says. Dane, Dean knew it would be the native guy. He probably doesn't even think Dean is native. Fuck, the work sample. Dean can't say anything. He's supposed to be a fly on the wall, but the guy just swatted at him. Someone say something else, someone say anything else. The older of the two black guys, the more nicely dressed with a white beard and glasses says, I think it's interesting if he's doing what I think he's saying he's gonna do, which is essentially to put aside the pretension of documentation. He's moving away out of the way, so to speak. If he does it right, it will seem as if he isn't even the one behind the camera. It will almost seem like there isn't a camera person there at all. My main question is whether or not he'll be able to get people to come and tell their stories and to trust him with them. If he does, I think this could be important regardless of whether he turns it into something his own, something tangible or with vision or not. Sometimes we risk putting too much of the director's vision on stories. I like that he's going to allow the content to direct the vision. However it goes, these are important stories to document, period. Dean sees the native guy shift uncomfortably in his chair, tap Dean's application in a neat stack, then put it behind a bigger stack. The older white woman, who looks like Tilda Swinton, says, If he can raise the money and come out with a film that says something new, I think that's great and I don't know how much more there is to say about it. We've got 20 or so more applicants to review, and I'm sure there will be at least a few that will require serious scrutiny and discussion. Back on BART headed home, Dean sees his face in the dark reflection of the train window. He's beaming. He wipes the grin from his face when he sees it. He got it. It was pretty clear that he would get it, $5,000. He's never had that much money before, not once in his life. He thinks of his uncle and his eyes well up. He clenches them shut and keeps them closed, leans his head back, thinks of nothing. Let's the train take him home. When Dean came home to an empty house, there was an old looking camera on the coffee table in the front of the couch. He picked it up and sat down with it. It was the gun camera his uncle had mentioned with a pistol grip. He sat there with the camera in his lap and waited for his mom to come back alone with the news. When she walked in, the look on her face said everything. She didn't have to tell him, as if he hadn't been expecting it. Dean stood up, camera in hand. He ran past his mom out the front door. He kept running down their hill to Diamond Park. There was a tunnel that went below the park, about 10 feet high. It stretched some 200 yards, and in the middle for about 50 of those yards, if you were in there, you couldn't see a thing. His mom told him there was an underground waterway that went all the way out into the bay. He didn't know why he came or why he brought the camera. He didn't even know how to use it. Wind howled in the tunnel at him. It seemed to breathe. It was a mouth and a throat. He tried but failed to turn the camera on, then pointed it at the tunnel anyway. He wondered if he'd ever end up like his uncle. 
Then he thought about his mom back at home. She hadn't done anything wrong. There was no one to be mad at. Dean thought he heard footsteps coming from inside the tunnel. He scrambled up the side of the creek and was about to run back up the hill back home, but something stopped him. He found a switch on the side of the camera next to the words Bolex Payard. He, maybe it's Paylard. Um, he pointed the camera at the street lamp up the street. He walked over and pointed it at the mouth of the tunnel. He let it run the whole walk home. He wanted to believe that when he turned on the camera, his uncle was with him, seen through it. As he approached the house, he saw his mom in the doorway waiting for him. She was crying. Dean moved behind a telephone pole. He thought about what it might have meant to, lo to her, losing her brother. How wrong it had been that he'd left, like it was his loss alone. Norma crouched down and put her face in her hands. The camera was still running. He lifted it, pistol gripped, pointed it at her, and looked away. And that's the end of Dean's chapter. All right, we're now on page 45 with a new chapter, a new section with a new character. So we're going back to our page with the cast of characters. And this is Opal Viola Victoria Bear Shield woman in her 50s of Cheyenne descent. At age 11, in 1970, her mother took her and her half-sister, Jackie Redfeather, to Alcatraz to participate in the Native American occupation of the island. So that is the chapter um, we're getting into now. Page 45, Opal Viola Victoria Bear Shield. Me and my sister, Jackie, were doing our homework in the living room with the TV on when our mom came home with the news that we'd be moving to Alcatraz. Pack your things, we're going over there. Today, our mom said, and we knew what she meant. We'd been over there to celebrate, not celebrating Thanksgiving. Back then we lived in East Oakland in a yellow house. It was the brightest but smallest house on the block. A two bedroom with a tiny kitchen that couldn't even fit a table. I didn't love it there. The carpets were too thin and smelled like dirt and smoke. We didn't have a couch or TV at first, but it was definitely better than where we were before. One morning, our mom woke us up in a hurry. Her face was beat up. She had a brown leather jacket way too big for her draped over her shoulders. Both her top and bottom lips were swollen. Seeing those big lips messed me up. She couldn't talk right. She told us to pack our things then too. Jackie's last name is Redfeather and mine is Bear Shield. Both our dads had left our mom. That morning, our mom came home beat up. We took the bus to a new house, the yellow house. I don't know how she got us a house. On the bus, I moved closer to my mom and put a hand into her jacket pocket. Why do we got names like we do? I said. They come from old Indian names. We had our own way of naming before white people came over and spread all those dad names around in order to keep the power with the dads. I didn't understand this explanation about dads, and I didn't know if bear shield meant shields that bears use to protect themselves or shields people use to protect themselves against bears, or were the shields themselves made out of bears? Either way, it was all pretty hard to explain in school how I was a bear shield, and that wasn't even the worst part. The worst part was my first name, which was two, Opal Viola. That makes me Opal Viola, Victoria Bear Shield. Victoria was our mom's name, even though she went by Vicky, and Opal Victoria, uh, Opal Vi Viola, excuse me, came from our grandma, who we never met. Our mom told us she was a medicine woman and renowned singer of spiritual songs, so I was supposed to carry that big old name around with honor. The good thing was the kids didn't have to do anything with my name to make fun of me. No rhymes or variations. They just said the whole thing, and it was funny. We got on a bus on a cold gray morning in late January 1970. Me and Jackie had matching beat-up old red duffel bags that didn't hold much, but we didn't have much. I packed two outfits and tucked my teddy bear two shoes under my arm. The name Two Shoes came from my sister because her childhood teddy bear only had one shoe the way they got it. 
Her bear wasn't named One Shoe, but maybe I should have considered myself lucky to have a bear with two shoes and not just one. But then, bears don't wear shoes, so maybe I wasn't lucky either, but something else. Out on the sidewalk, our mom turned to face the house. Say goodbye to the girls. I'd gotten used to keeping an eye on the front door. I'd seen more than a few eviction notices, and sure enough, one was right there. Our mom always kept them up so she could claim she never saw them in order to buy time. Me and Jackie looked up at the house. It had been okay, the yellow house, for what it was. The first one we'd been in without either of the dads, so it had been quiet and even sweet, like the banana cream pie our mom made the first night we spent there, when the gas worked but the electricity hadn't been turned on yet, and we ate standing up in the kitchen in candlelight. We were still thinking of what to say when our mom yelled, BUS! And we had to scamper after her, dragging our matching red duffel bags behind us. It was the middle of the day, so hardly one, anyone was on the bus. Jackie sat a few seats back like she didn't know us, like she was riding alone. I wanted to ask my mom more about the island, like, but I knew she didn't like to talk on the bus. She turned like Jackie, like we all didn't know each other. Why should we speak our business around people we don't know? She'd say. After a while, I couldn't take it anymore. Mom, I said, what are we doing? We're going to be with our relatives, Indians of all tribes. We're going over to where they built that prison. Gonna start from inside of the cell, which is where we are now. Indian people, that's where they got us. Even though they don't make it seem like they got us there, we're gonna work our way out from the inside with a spoon. Here, look at this. She handed me a laminated card from her purse the size of a playing card. It was that picture you see everywhere. The sad Indian on a horse silhouette. And on the other side, it said, Crazy, crazy Horse's Prophecy. I read it. Upon suffering beyond suffering, the Red Nation shall rise again, and it shall be a blessing for a sick world. A world filled with broken promises, selfishness, and separations. A world longing for light again. I see a time of seven generations, when all the colors of mankind will gather under the sacred tree of life, and the whole earth will become one circle again. I didn't know what she was trying to tell me with that card, or about the spoon, but her mom was like that, speaking in her own private language. I asked her if there would be monkeys. I thought for some reason that all islands had monkeys. She didn't answer my question. She just smiled and watched the long, gray Oakland streets stream by the window like it was an old movie she liked, but had seen too many times to notice anymore. A speedboat boat took us to the island. I kept my head in my mom's lap the whole time. The guys who brought us over were dressed in military uniforms. I didn't know what we were getting into. We ate watery beef stew out of styrofoam bowls around a bonfire some of the younger men kept pretty big and hot with chunks of wood pallets. Our mom smoked cigarettes farther out from the fire with two big old Indian women with loud laughs. There were stacks of Wonder Bread and butter on tables with pots of stew. When the fire got too hot, we moved back and sat down. I don't know about you, I said to Jackie, my mouth full of bread and butter, but I could live like this. We laughed, and Jackie leaned into me. We accidentally knocked heads, which made us laugh more. It got late, and I was dozing when our mom came back over to us. Everyone's sleeping in cells. It's warmer, she told us. Me and Jackie slept in the cell across from our mom. She'd always been crazy in and out of work, moving us all over Oakland, in and out of our dad's lives, in and out of different schools, in and out of shelters, but this was different. We'd always ended up in a house, in a room, in a bed at least. Me and Jackie slept close on Indian blankets in that old jail cell across from our mom. Everything that made a sound in those cells echoed a hundred times over. Our mom sang the Cheyenne lullaby she used to sing to put us to sleep. I hadn't heard it in so long I'd almost forgotten it. And even though it echoed like crazy all over the walls, it was the echo of our mom's voice. We fell asleep quickly and slept soundly. Jackie got on a lot better than me. She fell in with a group of teenagers that ran all over the island. 
The adults were so busy, there was no way for the, them to keep track. I hung by my mom's side. We went around talking to people, attending official meetings, where everyone tried to agree on what to do, what to ask for, what our demands would be. The more important-seeming Indians tended to get mad more easily. These were the men. And the women weren't listened to as much as our mom would have liked. Those first days went by like weeks. It felt like we were going to stay out of there for good, get the feds to build us a school and medical facility, a cultural center. At some point, though, my mom told me to go out and see what Jackie was up to. I didn't want to go out there alone, but eventually got bored enough and went to see what I could find. I took two shoes with me. I know I'm too old to have him. I'm almost 12, but I took him anyway. I went to the other side of the lighthouse where it seemed like you weren't supposed to go. I found them by the shore closest to the Golden Gate. They were all over the rocks, pointing at each other and laughing in that wild, cruel way teenagers have about them. I told Two Shoes it probably wasn't such a good idea and that we should just go back. Sister, you don't have to worry. All these people, even the young ones over here, they're all our relatives. So don't be scared. Plus, if anyone comes after you, I'll jump down and bite their ankles. They would never expect that. I'll use my sacred bear medicine on them. It'll put them to sleep. It'll be like instantaneous hibernation. That's what I'll do, sister. So don't worry. Creator made me strong to protect you, Two Shoes said. I told Two Shoes to stop talking like an Indian. I don't know what you mean by talking like an Indian, he said. You're not an Indian, T.S. You're a teddy bear. You know, we're not so different. Both of us got our names from pig-brained men. Pig-brained? Men with pigs for brains. Oh, meaning? Columbus called you Indians. For us, it was Teddy Roosevelt's fault. How? He was hunting bear one time and then found this real scraggly old hungry bear and he refused to shoot it. Then, in the newspapers, there was a comic about that hunting story that made it seem like Mr. Roosevelt was merciful, a real nature lover, that kind of thing. Then they made the little stuffed bear and named it Teddy's Bear. Teddy's Bear became Teddy Bear. What they didn't say was that he slit the old bear's throat. It's that kind of mercy they don't want you to know about. And how do you know about any of this? You gotta know about the history of your people. How you got to be here. That's all based on what people done to get you here. Us bears, you Indians, we've been through a lot. They try to kill us, but then when you hear them tell it, they make history seem like one big heroic adventure across an empty forest. There were bears and Indians all over the place. Sister, they slit all our throats. Why do I feel like Mom told us all this already? I said. Roosevelt said, I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indians are dead Indians but I believe nine out of every ten are, and I shouldn't like to inquire too closely into the case of the tenth. Damn, T.S., that's messed up. I only heard the one about the big stick. That big stick is the lie about mercy. Speak softly and carry a big stick. That's what he said about foreign policy, and that's what they used on us, bears and Indians both. Foreigners in our own land. And with their big sticks, they marched us so far west, we almost disappeared. Then Two Shoes went quiet. That's the way it was with him. He either had something to say or he didn't. I could tell by what kind of shine I saw in the blacks of his eyes which one it was. I put Two Shoes behind some rocks and headed down to my sister. They were all gathered on a small, wet, sandy beach filled with rocks that thinned out or were covered where the water got deeper. The closer I got to them, the more I noticed Jackie was acting weird, all loud and crooked looking. She was nice to me, too nice. She called me over, hugged me too hard, then introduced me to the group as her baby sister in a too loud voice. I lied and told everyone I was 12, but they didn't even hear me. I saw that they were passing a bottle around. It had just gotten to Jackie. She drank long and hard from it. This is Harvey, 
Jackie said to me as she knocked the bottle into his arms. Harvey took the bottle and didn't seem to notice Jackie had said anything. I walked away from them and saw that there was a boy standing apart from everyone else who looked like he could have been closer to my age. He was throwing rocks. I asked him what he was doing. What does it look like? He said. Like you're trying to get rid of the island one rock at a time. I said. I wish I could throw this stupid island into the ocean. It's already in the ocean. I went down to the bottom. He said. Why's that? I said. Because my dad's making me and my brother be over here, he said. Pulled us out of school. No TV, no good food. Everyone running around, drinking, talking about how everything's going to be different. It's different, all right. And it was better when we were home. Don't you think it's good we're standing up for something? Trying to make things right for what they've done to us all these hundreds of years since they came? Yeah, yeah. It's all my dad ever talks about. What they've done to us, the U.S. government. I don't know nothing about all that. I just want to go home. I don't think we even have our house anymore. What's so good about taking over some stupid place no one wants to be? A place where people have been trying to escape from since they make it. I don't know. It might help. You never know. Yeah, he said. Then he threw a pretty big rock over where by the by where the older kids were. It splashed them and they yelled curse words at us I didn't recognize. What's your name? I said. Rocky, he said. So Rocky throwing rocks then, I said. Shut up. What's your name? I regretted having drawn attention to names and tried to think of something else to say or ask or say, but nothing came. Opal Viola Victoria Bearshield, I said as fast as I could. Rocky just threw another rock. I didn't know if he wasn't listening or if he just didn't find it funny like most kids did. I didn't get to find out either because just then a boat came roaring up from out of nowhere. Some of the older kids had stolen it from somewhere else on the island. Everyone walked toward the boat as it approached. Me and Rocky followed. You gonna go? I said to Rocky. Yeah, I'll probably go, he said. I went to Jackie to ask if she was going. Fuck yeah, she said, completely drunk, which was when I knew I had to go. The water got choppy right away. Rocky asked me if he could hold my hand. The question made my heart beat even faster than it was already beating from being on the boat and going so fast with all those older kids who had probably never driven a boat before in their whole lives. I grabbed Rocky's hand when we went up high off the crest of a wave and we kept our hands held like that until we saw another boat coming toward us, at which point we broke our hold as if catching us holding hands was why the boat was coming. At first I thought it was the police, but soon I realized it was just a couple of the older men who ran another boat back and forth between the island and the mainland for supplies. They were screaming something at us. The men forced our boat to the front of the island. It was only when they docked that I could really hear the screaming. We were being yelled at. All the older kids were pretty drunk. Jackie and Harvey took off running, which inspired everyone else to do the same. Me and Rocky stayed on the boat, watched the older guys scramble to do something about everyone falling and running and laughing, that stupid drunk laugh about nothing. When the two men realized they weren't going to catch anyone and that no one was going to listen, they left, either because they gave up or to get help. The sun was setting and a cold wind came in. Rocky stepped off the boat and tied it up. I wondered where he learned how to do something like that. I stepped off too and felt the boat rock as I left it. Fog was coming in low, slow to the point of creeping up past our knees. I watched the fog for what felt like minutes. Then I came up from behind Rocky and grabbed his hand. He kept his back to me, but he let me hold his hand like that. I'm still afraid of the dark, he said, and it was like he was telling me something else. But before I could figure out what that was, I heard screaming. It was Jackie. I let go of Rocky's hand and went toward the screaming. I caught the words, fucking asshole, then stopped and looked back at Rocky like, what are you waiting for? Rocky turned around and headed back toward the boat. When I found them, Jackie was walking away from Harvey every few steps picking up rocks and throwing them at him. Harvey was on the ground with a bottle in his lap, his head swaying, top-heavy. 
that was when I saw the resemblance. And I don't, didn't know how I hadn't noticed before. Harvey was Rocky's older brother. Come on, Jackie said to me, piece of shit, she said, and spit on the ground toward Harvey. We made our way up the incline that led to the stairs to the prison's entrance. What happened? I said. Nothing. What did he do? I said. I told him not to. Then he did. I told him to stop. Jackie rubbed at one of her eyes hard. It doesn't fucking matter. Come on, she said, then started to walk faster. I let Jackie go ahead. I stopped and held the rail at the top of the stairs next to the lighthouse. I thought to look back to find Rocky, then heard my sister yell for me to catch up. When we got back to our cell block, our mom was there sleeping. Something felt wrong about the way she was lying. She was on her back, but she always slept on her stomach. Her sleep seemed too deep. She was positioned like she hadn't meant to fall asleep that, the way she had, and she was snoring. Jackie went to sleep in the cell across from us, and I slid under the blankets with my mom. The wind had picked up outside. I was afraid and unsure about everything that had just happened. What we were still, what were we still even doing on the island? But I fell asleep almost as soon as I closed my eyes. I woke up with Jackie right next to me. At some point, Jackie had taken our mom's place. The sun came in on us, making bar-shaped shadows across our bodies. After that, we did nothing every day but find out what the meals were and when they would be served. We stayed on the island because there was no other choice. There was no house or life to go back to. No hope that maybe we would get what we were asking for, that the government would have mercy on us, spare our throats by sending boats of food and electricians, builders and contractors to fix the place up. The days just passed and nothing happened. The boats came and went with fewer and fewer supplies. There was a fire at some point, and I saw people pulling copper wire out of the walls of the buildings, carrying the bundles down to the boats. The men looked more tired and more drunk more often, and there were fewer and fewer women and children around. We're gonna get out of here, don't you two worry, our mom said to us one night from across the cell, but I no longer trusted her. I was unsure of whose side she was on, or if there were even sides anymore. Maybe there were only sides like there were sides on the rocks at the edge of the island. On one of our last days on the island, me and my mom went up to the lighthouse. She told me she wanted to look at the city. She said she had something to tell me. There were people running around like they did in those last days. Like the world was ending, but me and my mom sat there on the grass like nothing at all was happening. Opal Viola, baby girl, my mom said, and moved some hair behind my ear. She'd never, not once, called me baby girl. You have to know what's going on here, she said. You're old enough to know now, and I'm sorry I haven't told you before. Opal, you have to know that we should never not tell our stories and that no one is too young to hear. We are all here because of a lie. They've been lying to us since they came. They're lying to us now. The way she said they're lying to us now scared me. Like it had two different meanings and I didn't know what either one was. I asked my mom what the lie was, but she just stared off toward the sun. Her whole face became a squint. I didn't know what to do except to sit there and wait to see what she would say. A cold wind laid into our faces, made us close our eyes to it. She told me we could only do what we could do, and that the monster that was the machine that was the government had no intention of slowing itself down for long enough to truly look back to see what happened, to make it right. And so what we could do had everything to do with being able to understand where we came from, what happened to our people, and how to honor them by living right, by telling our stories. She told me the world was made of stories, nothing else, just stories, and stories about stories. And then, as if all of it was leading up to what she was going to say next, 
My mom paused, a long pause, looked off toward the city and told me that she had cancer. The whole island disappeared then, everything. I stood up and walked away without knowing where to. I remembered I left Two Shoes over by those rocks all that time before. When I got to Two Shoes, he was on his side and in bad shape, like something had chewed on him, or like the wind and salt had dimmed him down. I picked him up and looked at his face. I couldn't see the shine in his eyes anymore. I put him back down like he'd been. Left him like that. When we got back to the mainland, on a sunny day months after we'd first left for the island, we got on a bus and went back over near where we lived before we moved to the Yellow House, just outside downtown Oakland on Telegraph. We stayed with our mom's adopted brother, Ronald, who we first met the day we got to his house to live with him. Me and Jackie didn't like him one bit, but mom said he was the real deal, a medicine man. Mom didn't want to do what the doctors recommended. For a while, we went up north all the time, where Ronald would run sweats. It was too hot in there for me, but Jackie went in with Mom. Me and Jackie both told her she should do what the doctor said to do. She told us she couldn't, that she could only go the way she'd been going. And that was the way she went, slowly receding into the past like all those sacred and beautiful and forever lost things. One day, she just holed up there on the couch in Ronald's living room. She got smaller and smaller. After Alcatraz, after our mom died, I kept my head down. I focused on school. Our mom had always told us the most important thing we could do was to get educated and that people won't listen to you otherwise. We didn't upstand, end up staying at Ronald's all that long. Things went real bad real fast but that's a story for another time. When she was there, and even after she died, for a while he left us to ourselves. Me and Jackie spent all our time together when we weren't at school. We went to see Mom's grave as often as we could. One day, on the way home from the cemetery, Jackie stopped and turned to me. What are we doing? She said. Going home? I said. What home? Jackie said. I don't know. I said, what are we going to do? I don't know. You usually have some smart-ass answer. J just keep going, I guess. I'm pregnant, Jackie said. What? Fucking piece of shit Harvey, remember? What? It doesn't matter. I, I can just get rid of it. No, you cannot just get rid of... I know someone. My friend Adriana's brother knows someone in West Oakland. But Jackie, you can't. Then what? We raised the baby together with Ronald? No, Jackie said, then started to cry, like she hadn't cried at the funeral. She stopped, put her hand on top of a parking meter, and looked away from me. She wiped her arm across her face once, hard, then kept walking. We walked like that for some time. The sun behind us, our shadows slanted, stretched ahead of us. One of the last things Mom said to me when we were over there, she said, we shouldn't ever not tell our stories, I said. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? I mean having the baby. It's not a story, Opal. This is real. It could be both. Life doesn't work out the way stories do. Mom's dead. She's not coming back and we're alone, living with a guy we don't even know who we're supposed to call uncle. What kind of fucked up story is that? Yeah, mom's dead. I know. We're alone, but we're not dead. It's not over. We can't just give up, Jackie, right? Jackie didn't respond at first. We kept walking, passing all the storefronts on Piedmont Avenue. We listened to the constant lapping sounds of cars passing by like the sound of waves against the rocks on the shore of our uncertain futures. In an Oakland that would never be the same as it was before our mom up and left on a jagged wind. We came to a red light. When it turned green, Jackie reached down and took my hand. And when we got to the other side of the street, she didn't let go. That's the end of Opal Viola Victoria Bearshield's chapter here, or at least her first chapter. 
And that's where we will end this section, starting next time on page 62 with a new section, a new character. Hope that you are enjoying this book, There There by Tommy Orange. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time. Bye.